Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breaking of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion together and the yearling together. And the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In the day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for all peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. So as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus this Christmas, we have to remember Isaiah. Ben referenced Isaiah. In fact, one of these verses that I just read for you today in class. And sometimes Isaiah is called the fifth gospel because so much of Isaiah is spent prophesying what Jesus will do. So in our first of three Advent texts today, I want to point out a few things. First, pedigree. Okay, when I think of pedigree, the first thing I think about are horses and dogs. Horse racing is all about pedigree. When you're when you're watching the Kentucky Derby, they like to talk about the pedigree of the horse, right? And if you hear the horse is a descendant of Secretariat, you're like, oh, that might be a good one, right? That might be a good horse. Or we have dogs. Maybe you've heard, but the national championship dog is Winston, a French bulldog. And we're a little partial to French bulldogs now in our family. And uh, so it's, it's the winner. We're excited. But you know who's more excited? Winston's owner. The NFL defensive lineman who plays for the Chargers owns Winston, and I think he might make more money off this dog than he's going to make off his NFL career after it being a national champion. But our Frenchie, however, is not related to Winston. It does not have championship bloodlines. That's why we're taking it to Ben this week to get neutered, right? <laughs> much, much to the protest of my father. I'll have to tell you about that later. Dad, if you're listening, sorry, we're still going to do it. But it's hard for me. As an American, it is just hard for me to get into human pedigrees. I mean, we fought a revolutionary war to get away from this. Why should I care so much about it? I, I tend to value more of like, you know, the underdog, the person who picked themselves up, who, who elevated their status, who uh, worked hard or had some talents or abilities. So it, it, it's hard. But Israel wanted a king, right? They fought for this king, and they wanted a king to be like their best king ever, the son of Jesse, King David, who oddly enough elevated his uh, status in a way that us Americans can appreciate. So why is the genealogy of Jesus so important? Well, it fulfills the prophecy that Jesus, in fact, was from the messianic lineage of David. But our human eyes can be deceived when we read genealogies and we hear about pedigrees, we can perceive that the power that Jesus received came from his lineage, came from his genetics. So to help me explain this, maybe you heard about the, the uh, controversy on the Avalanche broadcast this week. You see there was a rookie playing for the first time, Sean Fowdy, and uh, they wanted to talk about his pedigree how athletic his parents were, how he was an up-and-coming star. And so you know how they do these on the broadcast. They find the parent in the crowd, the, the parents, and they talk about them. Well, apparently there were some judgmental people out there because when they showed the parents, there were questions as if they were really that athletic. Okay, uh, Sean Fowdy's mother was an Olympic sprinter. 
And so people were writing in saying, ah, oh, no, 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 they're not that athletic. And it actually got to be really embarrassing because the broadcast had to come on and say, we got the wrong people in the crowd. And actually, those aren't the parents. These are the parents, which has led to lots of jokes around our state. Um, and the poor, the poor family that got put on TV without knowing it, they must be really embarrassed. They, they're going to get like some season tickets or something out of it, I, I hope. They take care of them. But this is like people calling into question, well, Jesus from Nazareth, I mean, is he really? Does he really have this lineage? What's going on here? And so the weird thing about the genealogy of Jesus is the people in the lineage aren't really that great. They have some really big character flaws that would seem to disqualify them. We talked in class about Rahab the prostitute, right? She's a foreign prostitute. What is she doing? Maybe even worse, go look up Lamech in the first part of Genesis. See the things that he did. Some bad people that shouldn't be in this royal lineage, not to exclude the, the faults and the sins of David himself. But ultimately, Jesus is what gives these people value. He's the ones that elevates their status. The honor they receive is an opposite kind of honor. It's that they were the ones that preceded Jesus. He brings their pedigree up. They were the ones that come before them. That's the honor that we are going to continue to explore today. So the other thing that stands out to me is how Jesus will judge the world, really in the center part of this text, not with human eyes or human ears, but with righteousness. Righteousness comes up over and over again. And I'm not much of a rules guy myself. You know, I, I see the faults in human rules, and we need them for good reasons, but uh, sometimes they can only do for us so much. But ultimately, the judge I'm worried about is God as judge, right? Ultimately, I believe God's sovereign over all things, so those are the rules I really want to follow. Those are the ones I really want to seek out in my life. And so then Isaiah goes on to give some really weird animal metaphors. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the goat, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear. And then there's really weird child neglect ones too. Uh, the infant near the cobra's den doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, putting their, the child putting their hand in the viper's nest. This sounds like something they do in Abilene to catch rattlesnakes, right? What does all this mean? Well, a predator and a prey relationship is very brutal can be very brutal. There's a reason why National Geographic cuts away when the, the predator is about to kill the prey, because it can be such a brutal experience. One is literally feeding off of the other to stay alive. And life can be brutal sometimes. Humans can be pretty brutal to each other at times. People can prey on each other which is certainly happening in Jesus' time. And so the metaphors are an example of what happens when the Messiah comes, that it will be a season of peace. What do we talk a lot about Christmas? We talk about peace. And so we see account after account of Jesus feeding large groups of people or eating with people. We see him healing people of both their physical and spiritual problems. And yes, Jesus does have conflicts with the predators of his day. But remember, on the cross, there was an eclectic group of people. There were Roman soldiers, there were Jews, there were criminals who all came together to the conclusion that this guy was the Messiah, the Son of God. So let's pray before we go any farther. Our Father in heaven, we come before you and we ask that you would make room in our hearts this Christmas, Christmas to make, make space for your arrival. So we prepare for your coming, your arrival, both every Christmas as a baby, but when you come again. And God, we've lost so much this year. So today, give us supernatural hope because of your arrival. Pour through me the gift of preach, preaching that Christ may dwell deep in our hearts. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Okay, so we started our series on Advent last week, as I told you by special request of Linda, and Advent means arrival. Uh, this season is all about remembering and working towards the arrival of Jesus. So Advent would be missing something 
if we didn't include the one who prepared the way for Jesus, John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. When he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, he said, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he, he will clear his thresh floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Really encouraging words from John the Baptist there. But there's something about John the Baptist's disposition that's so appealing, right? At first glance, he's got the pedigree. He's the son of a temple priest. He's in line to have a significant amount of authority and status and power. And yet, he decides to do what is weird. He wears weird clothes. He goes out in the wilderness, eats bugs in the desert. And remember, this is a time when people were being oppressed by temple laws. So this weird dude in the desert on a horse with no name has this anti-temple stance that makes people want to check him out. At Christian colleges, they have people like John the Baptist. They call them Bible majors. See, Bible majors do really weird things to stand out if you've never been to Christian colleges. Uh, things like wearing worn out clothes or no shoes or handmade sandals to try to look like uh, Jesus. Um, I even know of a few that will go to the girls' lobby to do their Bible study devotional time. I'm not making this up. Uh, we walked into the Aubrey of, uh, or the lobby of Aubrey's dorm one time. My friends and I, we were all going out together, and there was a Bible major in the corner doing his personal devotionals. And my friend called him out. Oh, I see what you're doing there. I see what you're going for. But you know what? Can't hate on him. It worked. The ladies noticed. And people notice the Bible majors, okay? They are doing these weird things, and so everyone's like, hey, buddy, why don't you wear shoes? Or why are you wearing, you know? And there's a group of people that sits and asks them about it and has these conversations. And really, they're kind of building a following, right? They like to be known for this weirdness. But John the Baptist does something different. He does something really striking, something even more odd. He's gained this crowd. He's gained this following, right? It's time to, like, write a book and go on tour. Make some money off of this. What's he going to do? This is his 15 seconds of fame. And then he says, someone more powerful than I is coming. One whose sandals I'm not worthy to wear. See, John the Baptist is more than fine to move out of the way for Jesus. John is okay becoming less so Jesus can become more. John the Baptist is content with his lot in life. He is content to be a footnote to Jesus. And the question is, are we? Are we? When asked who, what they want to be in life, Gen Z, our teenage age students today, their number one response would be influencer. I want to be an influencer. An influencer is someone with a large following on social media. They, they're usually on multiple platforms now, and they're kind of famous for being famous. It's kind of like the line of the Kim Kardashian and the Paris Hiltons that they just have this big following, and they get paid all these sponsorships and make tons of money just to be famous. 
And so we have to ask ourselves in life, is that what John the Baptist was preparing us for? I mean, as Christians, is, is that the life that we're trying to emulate and work towards and follow? A life of self-promotion and uh, a, a life of, oh, look at me, I'm so cool, where we're maybe a little narcissistic and high up on who we are. Uh, I'm not sure what this looks like in your life. So I'm going to use my profession as an example. We live in the age of celebrity preachers, of preaching influencers. If someone has the right charisma, the right amount of connections, they can uh, be very, very wealthy by preaching this book. I'm convinced that uh, most of Christian history would be looking at our day and age and going, this is really weird. Right? What is going on here? I mean, you mean to tell me instead of being persecuted, burned at the stake, rejected, cast away, you now to get to live in a mansion and travel the world on a private jet? I think the early church would have just been baffled by it. But what's interesting to me is I've talked to the preachers who recommend the self-promotion books, right? About how to be a Christian influencer. I've seen uh, the conniving and politics between who gets to be the keynote speakers at different conferences. I've witnessed the church budget used to build a brand for a preacher instead of building and spreading and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And it makes me sick. It makes me feel uncomfortable. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I love being here, this church. I just find it so refreshing. I'm totally off everyone's radar and I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. And I guess that, I'm guessing that you've worked with similar people too, right? I'm guessing you've got that coworker or that boss or maybe that rival business who's just really into promoting themselves and how they're successful and all their accomplishments and all the things that they've done and they want everyone to notice. They want to do all these things to elevate what others think of us. And all of this I think of in comparison with the testimony of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, I think, shows us as Christians what it looks like not to miss the point, to keep the focus on Jesus and nothing else. And I listen to various preachers. Most of them that I listen to, I listen to because I find them to be genuine and authentic people who are Christ-centered. And so I admire some preachers, but do you know who I really am thinking about this this week admire more? I admire the people who serve diligently at our local churches for decades without recognition, without oftentimes standing in front of the congregation, without an award or anyone patting them on the back. I think of the countless people doing the hard work of loving and caring for people in ways that no one sees. I think of people who do the unseen work that isn't very glamorous to keep the church together. Do you want to know something? No one notices the tech guy until something messes up, right? I never know. When everything goes smoothly, no one goes, hey, Steve, you did a good job today, right? But it's really hard. You got to, hey, Steve, man, it, it worked today. Good job. It's coming together, right? Instead of just, oh, whoa, what's going on? Uh, this weekend, you know, in celebrating my grandma, I, I was just, the thing, one of the things that came up over and over again was the tireless work she did for decades for her local churches that she attended. Last one for almost 40 years. Uh, one of the stories that I had forgotten is she, in her spare time, whenever she'd have a little free time, she would just start making lasagnas, okay? She'd put them in a foil pan and she'd freeze them. And then she'd get the call, someone had a baby, someone was sick, someone needed some food, and she'd out. So you know what we ate yesterday at her, her reception? Lasagna. <laughs> Lasagna. Um, and we even got to bring some home. Just a cool story that meant so much to me. And I know so many people in our church do unseen, unspoken work all the time. Um, but who I keep thinking of is Lynn. How she just did that for us. And many of us laughed last week after my sermon last week because we knew 
it was a sermon that Linda would have been entirely uncomfortable with, right? <laughs> For us to be talking about her uh, in such ways, she didn't want to be the center of attention. But I can't help but think that she knew we needed something. That somewhere in her wisdom, she knew we were all going to need to take up the work she was doing and do some of that work that wasn't so glamorous, that no one saw us doing, that just needed to be done. See, all that unseen work in the background is what I think we are called to do as followers of Jesus. And so John the Baptist reminds us that we're to prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus, that we must produce or must prepare for Jesus to take center stage, for Jesus to be the influencer, for Jesus to be the hero of the story. And I find that so compelling because it means we get to give up being all those things. We get to allow Jesus to do that. And we don't have to have this hole in our heart feeling like we have to be so much as a person, as a brand, as an influencer. And we can just let Jesus do that. So as we come to the end of this sermon, the Advent text for today, the last of the three, Paul says these words in his letter to the Romans. Chapter 15, verses 4. We'll start in verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and encouragement they provide we might have hope may the god who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that christ jesus had so that with one mind and with one voice you may glorify the god and father of our lord jesus accept one another then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews, and on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. Again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up. One will arise to rule over the nation. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit. So Paul is this Old Testament scholar, and he's telling the church in Rome that all the Bible is leading to this point. Everything is leading towards Jesus so that we may have endurance. Endurance is the highlighted part of that first, that first uh, portion of this text. Life takes endurance, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but for me lately, it's felt more like a sprint and less like an endurance race, right? I'm tired. I'm worn out. We've got a lot going on. But this is why we come to church every week. This is why we study the scriptures. Because when we study, it gives us endurance. Endurance to live our lives. And so it's no mistake we've talked about that so many Christians are choosing not to go to church. And this makes alarm bells go off in the minds of elders and ministers. And sure, someone can study on their own, and they can look at, on the, at the text their own, but I think some of this needs to happen in community. Because if we're really honest, right, it's easy to not study so much when we're at home. To let it slack, to, let, to go a week or two or even more, and to not receive that encouragement from reading the scriptures daily and when we do this our human heart is prone to seek out all kinds of idols to replace those scriptures in our mind and it usually leads to devastating consequences so paul does all this to give us hope hope that jesus has come and jesus will come again but paul what paul has to say next is what israel always missed they always miss this point from the very beginning paul is advocating that all of this should be passed on to all people. Think about this. Paul has every reason to be selfish. 
to keep Judaism, to keep Jesus for his nation, for his people. Especially with all the Gentiles and all the pagan things they were participating in around them at the time. I mean, Paul could just say, ah, man, you know, we're just not going to include you guys. But after one encounter with the resurrected Lord, it was enough to convince Paul everyone should be included. So Paul quotes passages throughout the Old Testament showing these Gentiles and Jews That this is for everyone. That it has always been for everyone. And did you notice that Paul cited the very text that we started off reading today? The good news of Advent is that Jesus came for you and me. Our pedigree, our lineage, uh, our our need to uh, be connected to people of power, of status. None of that matters. Only what matters is our lineage and our connection to Jesus and how he makes us and brings us into his family. Above all things, the thing that makes us worthy, the thing that gives us value is our identity in Christ. And John the Baptist was bringing people into his family by baptizing them in the wilderness. Baptism is our act of faith. It's our commitment to become the root of Jesse, to link ourselves to this family tree. And something amazing happens in this moment. John the Baptist is quick to point out that John is only baptizing with water for the repentance of sins. It's just water. There's nothing special about the water. It reminds me of the story as we close um, that my birth mother tell me. I don't think my birth mother watches these sermons, so I can share this story with you. Uh, She had a very honest, sincere question. My birth father baptized me. And she said to me, after all the sins that he's committed, we've gone through them all. She asked, did my baptism still count? She wondered if she needed to be re-baptized. And I think John the Baptist was getting at something in our statements here. See, the problem is where we uh, place the power in this situation, where we think the power lies. I told her her baptism is more than valid, that I sure hope that God doesn't base people's adoption on the one baptizing them, right? If that were the case, I would feel qualified to baptize no one. I'm like, I am out. You're going to have to find someone else. But John the Baptist is quick to point something out. That Jesus will baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Have you ever noticed how, what, what the action of baptism is like? It's not, a, it's not an action of power. It's an action of surrender. That you are leaning back. That in a sense you are going down into the grave and you are coming up 